I jokingly said to Lori before that I think I, in a lot of ways I may have brought this on myself, this entire situation, because when I was a child, I knew what my passion was, I knew what my drive was, I knew what my desire was. I loved magic. And I would say to myself, you know, these names that people think of, I would say, you know, one day my name is going to eclipse all of them. I'm going to be the greatest magician there's ever been. And I had no idea that that meant I would have 20 years to sit alone in a prison cell and practice and study. Friends, welcome back. We are joined by a very special guest today, Mr. William Ramsey. And we're going to talk specifically about a case that never seems to go away. It's back in the news yet again called the West Memphis Three. Now, William has had me on his show a couple of times to talk about my adventures growing up in the Scientology cult. And now I have the great pleasure, William, of reversing the tables. How are you, my man? Doing well. Thanks for inviting me on the show, Doug. Great to be with you. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, to start off, William, before we jump into this, who is William Ramsey and what's sort of uh, the sojourn that you went on to extract yourself from consensus reality and go down rabbit holes it's a good question i think it just comes comes from grow, like being in washington dc and seeing what they are up to and kind of uh social engineering and propaganda a lot of lies so that was like oh a lot of this corporate media is baloney so you that grew up really, in washington you grew up in washington, no i was there DC? for three years i was i was there for three years so i just kind of learned to kind of look beyond kind of what does what they were trying to create is the Overton window or whatever. That goes all the way back. I kind of was involved with the death of Vince Foster in a very tangential way, but that was a total fraud too. They just made up a huge pile of lies for that. So I was very sensitive to it. 9-11 happened. I became kind of a lone 9-11 researcher. I noticed stuff on there that kind of tied into the occult. And so that led to my first book, Prophet of Evil, Oster Crowley, 9-11 in the New World Order. And then when that was published, self-published originally in 2010, I was like, okay, who's Crowley? Who's he influenced? Who else is he influenced? So I was working on a book called Children of the Beast, which I ended up publishing. But as I was working on that, I started coming across a lot of cult characters, David Bowie, some of these other, uh, Ozzy Osbourne, all these other people who went through a phase of studying Crowley. And during one of these things, I was, I was on YouTube and came across a video of this case, the West Memphis Three case. This is about 2012. And it was a clip of Damien Eccles, who's kind of like the central figure. He was uh, on the stand being asked about Aleister Crowley. And I'd just gone through, really, and I was studying Crowley. So I was like, oh, wow, there's Aleister Crowley in this case. And then I did some research and heard that they had been let out of jail in August of 2011. So I thought, well... If they got let out of jail, there must have been a technicality because I had seen the original Paradise Lost documentary back in 1996, which kind of led me to believe that they were involved in the death of these three young boys. So then I was looking into the case from a different angle, kind of the occult angle. Why are these guys out? Who are all these celebrity supporters? Why is Johnny Depp involved? Asking these questions, you know? And I was really scratching my head. What is the truth? The fortunate thing is back then all the cases files or many of the case files, most of the case files were compiled on one website called Callahan 8K. So I was able to just kind of exhale and sit down and start organizing. They weren't very well organized by time, but I was able to really see what the police saw. I saw what a lot of the testimony was, the court proceedings, the two different court proceedings. It was bifurcated between Jesse Miss Kelly and Baldwin and Eccles. So I was, and they were all found guilty. So I was able to look at it and go, Hey, these guys, this all the evidence shows that they were in the juries, both were unanimously found them guilty. So what why, if they were found guilty, are they talking about their public innocence? Why are all these celebrities involved? So then I kind of looked through again, and at that time nobody said the occult was involved at all. That was a very passe, unpopular position. And I'm looking through this, and this is this like heavily duty involved in the occult. And I saw Crowley, and then I learned that Eccles was a member of the OTO, and he had actually been talking to the OTO, which is Crowley's kind of one of his secret societies mm -hmm. in the OTO in Arkansas, where the crimes happened. And he was actually, you can actually go back and read this document, SK 931, I actually remember, where he admits that he's an OTO member for a thelemite. Right. And he gave a lot like books of his occult books to a library. So the OTO library is named the Damien Eccles Library. Anyway, so there are other factors in this case. So then I'm like, who are all these celebrities supporting them? And then I start researching, I start seeing these same tattoos, 
these t- same styles that I had learned and, and understood from list reading or looking at Children of the Beast and people like Kenneth Anger. So I was like, wow, these guys are really tied into this occult stuff. And that led my, me to my second book, Abomination, Devil Worship and Deception. Crowley was definitely a devil worshiper, hated Christianity. Um, so that's when I published, self-published that in 2012. And that kind of, you know, it was not popular at all. Most people said the P, they believe the PR. They generally believe the PR to this day. Most people who watch TV, most people who don't watch TV understand really the mechanics because they can read for themselves my book and a couple other books but uh he was very much in the public eye Eccles decided to go to oh, that's what he, Eccles decided to go on like a publicity tour tour he was on the view he's with Piers uh, what's his name Piers Morgan Piers Morgan thank you and so he was on like this huge publicity tool tour and then he had another documentary so there were three documentaries that i think hbo put out the paradise lost series 96 and 2000 and those kind of changed the public dynamic they started blaming the stepfathers they went to mark byers and then they switched from him to the other stepfather terry hobbs which should tell you a lot like why are you switching your stepfather's uh guilt so um and then and then there was another documentary called west of memphis that was put out by uh, i can't, I can't remember her name but Amy Berg was her name. She was the director. And then there was a movie that uh, was called Devil's Knot based right. upon the book of record, which I think is really poorly written and excises a lot of facts, in my opinion. It omits all kinds of stuff, uh, important stuff to understand the case. Um, and that is Mara Leverett wrote that book, Devil's Knot. And the movie was based on it. Not very good, great actors, but really not that great of a film. And right, kind of right. just leaves the stuff up. It is very Hollywood and didn't come to any conclusions. But uh, so anyway, so that was kind of like uh, my position. I did a lot of videos that were on YouTube on my old channel, The Cold Investigations, which got burned, book burned by uh, Google. I keep saying you because it was really Google's policies. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of it's lost. I still have a lot of those videos somewhere around. We can watch some of them now, but I really haven't changed my position that mm. uh, Eccles was involved with Baldwin and Miss Kelly in a crime against these three young eight-year-old boys. And so you wrote that in 2012, and you stand by what you wrote today. It, you say it yeah, stands up. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, like, there's I- things like well, you know, things that I remember that I should have put in. Of course, that I forget, of course. and there's probably some details, but I think it's really good enough to make my point. It's all based upon the court records. He had a 500 page psych exhibit, for right? His, that was uh, death penalty defense, yeah. That exhibit 500. If you want to see a very different type of person, yes, indeed, he's been in three different mental institutions. So it's a, one in Oregon and two in Arkansas that have consistent kind of uh, t- stories about this guy. Not standard. His family's afraid of him. He drinks blood. Um, so there's a lot of stuff there, but I really should have put in one of the, my regrets if I do an update is to put in the appeal because they appealed to the Supreme court from the lower court and the Supreme court of Arkansas affirmed everything in the lower court. So people think that like, oh, it was a tongue jury and the, the hillbilly, you right. know, judge was from, just came from a KKK meeting and a fundamentalist. Right. And, Dude, you know, it's gotten court, so out there. Hey, yeah, it be- just got really crazy. There's all these crazy stories. When you have the Supreme Court of Arkansas affirming everything, that means the appellate process worked. That's why we have this kind of a, you know, go. And they actually did do a writ of certiorari. There was a lot of lawyers. He's had like five or six different lawyers. The best. But one dude. was a writ of certiorari where you asked the Supreme Court to look at your case, and the Supreme Court did not take that writ. They just there was nothing there. Usually they'll take a writ where there's like a real interesting element of law or a conflict between different uh federal jurisdictions but there was nothing there so that writ got denied and the, everything stood up until 11th and he actually what's interesting too which they don't like to talk about is that what they did on august in august of 2011 is plead guilty again to first degree murder and they had literally signed on the dotted line you can read these papers that say there's enough evidence that could find me con- convicted of first degree murder so they literally pled guilty and they said they wouldn't sue the state of Arkansas. So there's all these threats to, to sue the state of Arkansas for whatever reason. This, there's all these public PR things about DNA not working out or not being properly investigated. 
but they wrote for 10 years they would i think if i had to go back and look at those documents but they, they wouldn't sue the state of arkansas for anything that they accept and they were on 10 years of probation that just ended 2021 it's date coincident with this hey william before we jump because there's so you've already given a great introduction but let's say somebody doesn't know anything about this case and they've just watched perhaps P paradise lost part one when it came out on hbo right so here we have the latest um information uh this came out january 18th a tweet by damien eccles saying the prosecutor in arkansas has refused to cooperate with new dna testing he says if we want it done We'll have to fight for it in court. He plans to attempt to solve or prevent it from happening every step of the way. So this is where we're at today in this 30-year saga. But let's say somebody doesn't know anything about this case. Could you give a quick timeline or sequence of events beginning from the murders of the young eight-year-old boy, which I believe was on, what, May 5th, May 5th. 1993, Correct. right? Leading up to the documentaries, why the hell did that happen? The three different ones that were <laughs> quite contradictory leading up to the West of Memphis documentary, which is the most Hollywood eyes. I'm sorry. I, I don't believe these things are just He ridiculous. makes some amazing admissions in that West of Memphis, though. That I, I don't know why his lawyers allowed him to make that then. He wanted to be the greatest magician ever that ever lives in his own voice. Yeah, That's we're actually going to start up. this. We're going to start this podcast yeah. off with that clip, man. Um, right. Not only that, William, but the thing is so contradictory and it's entered the court of public opinion. This is another reason I wanted to talk about this, because Johnny Depp, who is entered the court of public opinion. We've been barred with nothing but that, has connections to Eccles as well, and perhaps played a role in extracting himself. So could you please give a quick sequence of events for people that know nothing about this, of the murders, the sequence of documentaries leading up to their release, but they're still guilty, let's never forget that, in 2011, I believe, and then leading up to where we stand today with the new DNA evidence. Could you string it all together for people? It's very complicated. Yeah, it really yeah, is. A maybe a brief ver yeah. version, because I know I'm asking a lot, man. But. No, but 1993, three young boys go out for a bike ride. They disappear. They're being searched for by their families and the police. Uh, overnight, the next day, a cop is looking in a place called Robin Hood Hills. He finds the shoe of a child. The three boys are found in a ditch, submerged with sticks. Uh, they're brought to the surface. They're tied in a very strange way uh, from wrist to ankle. And one of them has, like, the genitals are torn off, like they're just not there. Um, there's uh, cut marks to some of their faces, and so it looks like some bruising. There was one had a skull fracture, very serious skull fracture. So the cry went out, who's done this? Um, the police are looking around. They're trying to figure out some guy who is Eccles. Uh, parole officer or juvenile officer says, hey, maybe you should look at this guy. Echoes gets interviewed, but the police are still kind of trying to figure out and get more information. Uh, about a month later, June 3rd, 1993, they bring in a guy, Jesse Miss Kelly. They don't know much about him. His father's there, gives them approval to go into the police, off, the police station and where he gives a confession. Um, he confesses. He says this guy, J uh, Damian Echoes and Al uh, Baldwin, Jason Baldwin are involved, and that leads to their arrest. Um, part of the interview of the, the confession of Miss Kelly is recorded, and so that kind of leads, you know, they're arrested, the public goes crazy. They're trying to figure out what's going on with Eccles. They, their trials are bifurcated. I think that the, the reason it was split is because they were going to testify against themselves. They, they, they couldn't bring in, they were going to have information from Miss Kelly from his confession. So they couldn't have him in the same trial as Baldwin and Eccles, if I remember correctly. So they bifurcate the trials. There's two separate uh, juries. They're both found guilty in 1994. Eccles is sentenced to death, Miss Kelly and Baldwin for life. Then, you know, it kind of people just kind of accepted it. But what the public, uh, you know, the, the jury and judge of the public uh, really started in 1996 with this Paradise Lost documentary that came out and people started getting interested. And I think HBO really tried to make, in my opinion, a cash cow out of it and made it a uh, trilogy. And so it's three Paradise Lost, headed by Berlinger, Joe Berlinger, who is really busy. He's done a lot of films. He did a the follow-up to the Blair Witch Project, which looks, his head... Head kind of uh, character 
emulates Eccles, which is very interesting. That's another side note. But Berlinger has been all over. He's been involved in um, so, some docu uh, film on Netflix and the documentary about Whitey Bulger. And uh, it really kind of seems to be friends with the two things. It was Berlinger and uh, Makovsky or something. He's passed away. But Berlinger, uh, I think that HBO did a real disservice with the public by kind of tinkering around with the public's understanding of what happened in the case by blaming the stepfathers. And it is interesting in the second documentary, both Eccles and Baldwin are 100% sure it's John Mark Byers. So they say that in there. And then in the third documentary into the present, they're blaming um, Terry Hobbs. And so who I've interviewed too, he has a book called Box Full of Nightmares. So he's been put through the, the whole ringer. You interviewed Terry Hobbs? Uh-huh. Yeah. You can really? look through it. William Ramsey Investigates. Yeah, check it out. Man, you Terry talked Hobbs, to Hobbs, everybody. So I kind of talked to a lot of people. Gary Meese. I've had people in wow. the... I mean, really, like I looked at this case through the lens of Crowley and kind of the occult, but other people right, looked right. at it through the innocence fraud movement. So Roberta Glass saw right. this as just another in this long line of where mm -hmm. convicted... Um, felons or convicted criminals are trying their case in the public that they lost in the court system. And it's really a, happening a lot. It's happening. Oh, I've noticed that. Is this is this something that's come out because of the internet, William, and the ability for the court of public appeal to influence? Is that why there's new, this innocent project? Everybody's trying to extract Absolutely. themselves from jail and revisit cases that have long since been solved? Right. Well, the innocence project has a financial incentive. The I'm criminals sure who've been convicted want to get out. They have a freedom incentive. Right. So they are like just BSing. And then there's a bunch of other celebrities like uh, Kim Kardashian who are just gobbling up their baloney that contradict that they say publicly that contradicts what happens in court or omits stuff from the court. So this innocence fraud, the West Memphis three to me are clearly in that innocence fraud uh, realm, but they're also heavily involved in the occult right, before right. the crime. In I mean, this is all tested. Eccles wrote a book, Life After Death, where he talks about he's practicing magic in jail. He used it as kind of like a, what do you call it? Like a, like to a, extract like a temple or jail? something. Yeah, like he was doing magic all day, eight hours a day. And then he gets mm -hmm. out and he gets all these occult tattoos and starts writing occult books and teaching occultism. Uh, in a very general sense, he has a There's whole nothing bunch of suspicious ideas. there, William. The detractors are saying he simply got into the occult. He's a Wiccan. He practices white magic. He's just doing right. that to kill time in jail. What would you say to come on, dude? You know, he's well, just I mean, there's there's all this proof that he's involved in the OTO. He always posts about Aleister Crowley, who was a very nasty person. Um, he knows a lot about Enochian magic. He has Enochian language on his body. He has a huge back tattoo that looks like a sun and rat almost. Um, there's a lot of problems, and he hangs out with very dangerous. He has pictures of him with Genesis P. Orridge, so he admired him before he passed away. Right, he was a right, huge right. occultist. Was He's, Genesis uh, P. Orridge, by the way, uh, that that he was a member of the Process Church, by the way, uh, yes, audience, yes. which is an offshoot of Scientology. Um, I'll put a video, he, by the way, in the link of that of, of a video to check out about this guy because he's a very interesting character. And William, he reminds me of L. Ron Hubbard in a certain way. I can see why people would be attracted to him because he speaks, he's very different. He speaks the same kind of way um, in word salad mode where it sounds enlightening, but I could just see what he's do, what he's doing and how much he picked up from Scientology brother, just by what I went through. Oh, with Scientology. I, have no I doubt. can see why people, if you're, if you're in a death metal band, that would be the ultimate cult to join dude, or would have been the process. Um, you know, William, I could kind of play devil's advocate here a little bit because I was, I'm, I still listen to death metal and heavy music. I've always loved it. So, you know, I went, never went around uh, killing anybody, but we would do something called pentagram rampages where, you know, I was like a 15 or 16 year old and we would go to um, cul-de-sacs and just make pentagrams because we were into death metal and we thought it was cool. We'd, we'd, we'd put a gasoline thing and light it on fire. And one time, uh, by the way, we... Uh, the fire was so big, we just stopped doing all that stuff. But we were your typical teenage run, run, running around, you know, screaming out to old ladies, hail Satan. It's just because we were into death metal, right? So what would you say to people that, I mean, one of the biggest myths or defense is that this is simply a dude that was into Crowley. What significance, in other words, that 
people are trying to dismiss it um, as what does the cult have to do with the, the murders? Let's just leave that out of it. What, what would you say to either Crowley apologists or people don't think it's a big deal? Now, William, again, I speak from experience, brother, because my dad was practicing Scientology, which is straight out of the occult. And then I ended up getting into it when I was 20. So even though I was just a typical heavy metal kid, I got involved in the occult being totally oblivious. We were using tools to help our life, William. We weren't sacrificing kids in the woods. But I was involved in that shit, too, which, as you know, from our interviews, fucked me the fuck up. I, I speak out about it, you know, now. So what would you how would you kind of like, you know what I mean? Differentiate between the Wiccans and the white magic people or whatever that just worship nature. Or that How do you how do you how do you wade through this whole freaking thing? Well, it's very hard. And some of these guys like Crowley influenced Gardnerian Wiccan. He was friends with Gardner and gave him a seal to like an OTO seal. It's in Children of the Beast. And so a lot of these occult people and groups, the more sophisticated they get, like Genesis Bjorge, they become occultists all across the board. Crowley encouraged all of his followers to join as many occult groups as they could. So you could be a witch and, Wiccan witch, OTO. Right. And I think that Eccles has, is more of a scholarly kind of, it has an encyclopedic knowledge of the occult. Mm -hmm. So he could play himself off as a Wiccan. You yeah. know, he wants the um, encyclopedia of magic. Uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but he asked for this book in jail about witchcraft. I think it was called the Encyclopedia of Witchcraft or something like that. And didn't but, uh, didn't uh, the mass didn't Magic and Theory and Practice by Crowley also make an appearance during the courtroom? Yeah, thing, right. right. So when I religion or, or, uh, originally said that was the video that I saw that involved Crowley on the desk of the prosecutor, I think his name was Price, is a, right. like a photocopy of Magic and Theory and Practice. And he's asking him echoes about Crowley because after he was arrested in jail, he had a piece of paper. And this is in the court record. You can check it out. He had a uh, thing where he was writing Alistair Crowley's, na Alistair Crowley's name, Jason Baldwin, with kind of a witch language underneath. Right, right. So each letter of the English alphabet would be a letter of this kind of different language. So he was doing calculating stuff with witchcraft on that or whatever, like occultism. And so he was directly asked about that. Who's this man, Aleister Crowley and all this stuff. So. And he initially he tried to hide it too, right? Didn't he right. kind of try to uh, make it not? What I'm asking is, was it a big deal? Was he practicing magic a lot at that point? Did he specifically take it up um, during <clears throat> he was the asked prison? In court, he was asked in court in 1994, what do you know about magic? And he, his response was, I know everything. I don't remember what wow. he said verbatim. So he said that at 18. So he seemed to knew a lot about that. Wow. And there's other researchers who've looked in. I don't want to mention their names because I haven't gotten their approval. But a lot, this whole death of these young boys is very druidic. Somebody who's right. like, have you ever, That's have you ever point. heard of the Bogmen? Is that, wait, are you talking about, nah, this is sounding familiar. From... So there, there were sad, like the druids were this kind of earth cult, kind of um, wick, pre Wiccan. I mean, it's even druidism kind of floats into Wiccanism. Mm -hmm. But they were kind of like uh, there were the Romans actually had a lot of problems with the Druids two thousand years ago, so they were kind of like their witches. The Ver, uh, the what is it, Bersingeteris? I forgot what the name of the tribe was, but they had these witches, and they would do these ritual sacrifices for the gods or the seasons and things like that. And they would, when they were done, they would take these people and shove them into the bog with staves or sticks, and that's how the boys right. Were were deposited in there and there's a lot more other interesting things so Did they the were turtles ritual. have anything to do with the right well that's a whole uh, that's a whole okay, other we... public kind of thing we can get into these so-called snapping turtles the problem with the whole snapping turtles no william was... i don't believe that i thought that was i actually turned off the movie once they went into the turtles they had yeah. my attention well, we, I, I can that, tell you that it's fake. but i was wondering is it any no i believe you i was just wondering, I did, it's very that... simple no doug mm -hmm. it's very simple one of the boys bled out which means oh. that the turtle didn't cause had to have caused i didn't know that the injury while the uh, the crime was taking place i was right? just wondering william if the turtles had anything to do with the actual rituals uh speaking oh, of I the rituals so. no, 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 i don't think so one of the <clears throat> things that stuck out to me right away is we know that famous passage from crowley where you know the best sacrifice is a young boy eight and they even say does he even say eight years old yes yeah is that perfect I'm, perfect innocence yeah young child what about the actual day that it was done uh, May fifth. Any wow. cults? Is that an occult day or any? I think, I think that that day was selected per like the perfect date of the Druid calendar. Yeah. Right. Right. That was it. What? That wasn't a. It wasn't <laughs> the fourth or the sixth. I think that was the date. And there's all. Yeah. There's a lot of problems. 
it gets pretty it gets pretty hairy what are some of the um i mean you have this huge thick book where you actually have the case files right and what are some of the myths or some of the things that weren't brought out in the documentary that you find yourself maybe fighting with other people that have like i said just seen the the pr version well they never talk about the uh, exhibit 500 that's totally mm -hmm. avoided so you'll never see that in the documentaries or anything like that a lot of the confessions the multiple confessions of jesse miss kelly which some of them are recorded so you can listen to him after he's convicted so there's no reason for him he, his, there's one where he confesses on a bible there's another one where he confesses against the advice of his attorney so like his attorney saying jesse no 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 don't do it jesse's like i want to i want to tell the truth right you can listen to those so people leave out these multiple confessions of jesse miss kelly they always focus in on the original confession june 3rd 1993 and say like oh he's uh 70 I, I don't think he's very bright but they always say he's 70 keeps IQ. going down it keeps going what is it is 60 now uh, it'll be a 50 next week right when when it, this case comes up again <clears throat> right to to discount its validity you have to get it beneath 70. so mm -hmm. that's really i think where his attorneys were interested in getting that kind of uh status on him i, I don't think he's very bright but i think he's telling the truth he keeps telling it over and over the same gist of the story the kids walked up on us and you know, this got out of hand, we were drinking beer and blah, 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 blah. And I actually think there's a possible ability that he fingered two of them, but there might've been other people involved. I was going to ask I, you I, about Yeah, because there's Bojangles the guy. There's all right. kinds of stories about people leaving and driving off. Um, so the, we may never know the full story. I don't think anybody would want to admit that they were involved in it, but they had, they were involved at this place called Stonehenge, another kind of druidic mm -hmm. statement which was really an abandoned cotton gin. They were sacrificing dogs. They, I mean, this is according to Miss Kelly. They knew other people. They were reported to a guy that they called Lucifer who was older than them. So they, they were and seemed to have been networked with other people back then in 1993. William, who would, if you had to speculate, who would these other people be? We seem to see, especially, you know, uh, what, in the 70s and 80s, we had the satanic panic. We had all these serial killers from Son of Sam. Uh, you know, we had Manson. It seemed to be a phenomenon where they were serial killers. They'd pin it on one dude, call him a monster. But there were, if you dig deeper, I'm sure you've, of course, you've read Dave McGowan's book. You've had him on your show, I assume, when he was around. I I've gone down that. these. Yeah. What do you, I was on what, a show with him and Ed Opperman. I listened to that. That was a yeah, fantastic so show, by the way. I miss that freaking guy, man. I, we really need him right now. Yeah, I wish he was here. <laughs> yeah, me too. You don't, you don't have any speculation on, on his death. Do you think he just died of cancer, uh, smoking too much? I went to the book signing of him at uh, Book Soup on Sunset. Uh, what year was that? So I have a signed copy of his book, the, the Weird Scenes book. Nice. I, I remember when that was. Yeah, and he was chain smoking. Yeah, so I mean, his brother thinks that he got cancer from some suspicious thing, but I saw him chain smoking. So I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, it's all it's speculation. Loss, right? Yeah, loss, yeah. So I mean, there, there's a you... lifespan of people who are against the media and kind of do alternate research. It's not very long. It's they they tend up like dead. Whether it's Casalero, Lombardi, um, the guy who kind of I worked off of his name was uh, Captain May. They end up dying of strange things or commit mm -hmm. suicide. Like, these are guys kind of looking in parapolitical. Uh, the Jim Keith died of like on the operating table from a broken leg. Like I didn't strange, know that. Yeah, yeah, like you got to really be careful. Something you know. You know, you don't know which enemy you make, but yeah, it's a dangerous, uh, dangerous career. One of the guys I loved growing up, William, was River Phoenix, who was another one of these people that he didn't make the 27 Club. I believe he died at 23 outside the Viper Room, which was owned by Johnny Depp and a bunch of people. Well, a few people. The basis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I believe one of his career managers ended up disappearing or being whisked off. There's a, it, there always seems to be silly. Like you said, the hacks or, you know, other people seem to be promoted. And if you're a truth teller, I think river was trying to actually expose uh, the children of God, or at least bring to the fore 
Because you know, William, it's trauma-based mind control, basically. And you wake up in your 20s or 30s and you process it often. That's what happened to me. <clears throat> so I felt like my freaking life was on the line. I mean, Scientology doesn't attack nearly as much today or anything, but it, it was a big deal when I was waking up. And it felt they have a fair game policy, right? Fair game. Yeah, which happened to you speaking out about this. You put that book out in 2012, right after they had been released, still considered guilty. Which, but released, which is unusual in itself. That's kind of almost unprecedented, right? Um, and you must have, you got your own version of fair game, did you not? I mean, you must have had the, the, the equivalent of Justice of Johnny coming after you in, in that field, right? Yeah, it was rough. I mean, they tried, they got my book taken off of Amazon. So I had to plead with Amazon to put it back up. I got threatened. I got called every, every name in the book. So yeah, definitely, I definitely, the eye of Sauron, man. Was like looking down yeah, yeah. That's where it felt. So I mean that was that was part of the program. I don't wasn't uh, I didn't expect anything different. So did you expect the level that you may and have ended up getting when you put that out? I I think that the public opinion at that time was much different than it is now because people had encountered what they you know what the PR right, people right. Eccles had a PR guy, his name was Lonnie Sorry from like New York. Like he had a pro. So they got it that uh, they got the commanding heights of the, the media to believe what they said. But um, yeah, it was interesting. I learned a lot, you know, I bet I learned I a bet. lot, but I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, there was, a, Oh yeah, I was going to do, I mean, I don't talk about this too much. I was going to do a uh, Indiegogo to put out a documentary. They threatened me right there. I wasn't at the point where I could wow. do a lawsuit. So I knew what they were saying. And then, there was something like a short notice thing also. Hey, William, we're having a party in LA tomorrow. Sorry for the short, short notice. You think you can come out? You know, my name's Bob. It'd be great to talk with you about this new book, blah, blah, blah. Then I look up on this guy. I was like, I know what they're doing, man. I was, they're, they were trying to set me up. So You don't feel like your life is ever threatened or anything, do you? You feel relatively uh, safe, you know? I wouldn't, I wouldn't answer that question. I, I No, I not uh, just like I said, all these other people who've died, I know it's dangerous work. Yeah. I want to, hey, man, I really appreciate it personally because as I told you before we started this conversation, I was listening to your videos when I was waking up at a Scientology and you helped me out a shitload, man. So thanks for having the nutsack to actually talk about this because I, I know it can be challenging, especially when you're, like you said, I mean, there, there's things that are they, they, whoever they are, don't want known. So I, when, when we get to these serial killer cases, and maybe it's even going on today, what's behind this, do you think? Why are there so many? Is the West Memphis Three, let's just take this as an example. There's so many iterations. There's so many holes, so much changing of the narrative, so much money made off of this. What is the freaking point, William? What is it really about, dude? It's because we're not getting to the bottom of, of the case. It seems more like a spectacle, either to cover something else up or just to make money off freaking movies. What the hell? What, when I was listening to your videos and trying to take this apart, I just don't get it. What's it? What's going on? What's it actually about? It's the furthering this, the occult agenda. That's really what it's about. Wow. Yeah. Very so he's, Eccles has got impressed a lot of these people in the occult uh, world, I think, and knows a lot of people. There's overlaps with this case. And the Order of Nine Angles, because Echoes, one of his favorite guys is this guy Ford, who was the outer head of the Order of Nine Angles. So these guys are networked in ways that the public doesn't fully understand. Echoes knows a lot of people in the cult. Let's uh, show a quick video of what you're talking about. Yeah, here. well, let's watch this one. If you can, I sure. queued that up. If you can hit that and play it, if you can get the audio to work. Which one you got um, here, William? This that's the, that's the one the only... where Damien, Damien Echoes is being interviewed by Johnny Depp. So mess around with that. I'll bring this up. Because one of the things that's kind of peculiar is where did this celebrity endorsement uh, come from? Why did, why did all these high profile people just suddenly get interested in this, this case? If you disregard the state's satanic ritual theory, the entire nature of the crime changes. It starts you thinking, well, we're, maybe we're not looking for these extreme suspects. We're looking for someone who's kind of ordinary, invisible. Hey, Daniel, how are you? 
when you're looking at something like this and you're assessing a situation like this, which is so um, unjust, unfair, you know, I mean, it's on all sides, um, you make a decision, you know, and it's very simple, you know, for everybody, anybody and everybody who saw those initial documentaries, you make a choice. So he's saying that he got his information from those documentaries, not deep research, no other explanation. Just, yeah, I saw these documentaries and I want to just jump on board. How unusual. Am I going <clears> to <throat> watch the thing and go, oh, wow, that's really horrible. And then, you know, go out and get a milkshake. Or am I going to go, you know what? That's just, you know, it's, I, I can't. I'm, not, I'm unable to swallow that. <laughs> Okay, so anyways, there's a little bit of um, of him uh, and him jumping in for because out of the goodness of his heart, William. How did you? That's very, very yeah, interesting. Yeah, watch. It gets better. Watch. Uh, Depp knows about magic. Watch this. He's, he, he's mentioning, when he says science and religion, he's mentioning a phrase from... That's, by the way, what Scientology says, spiritual technology. It was sold as a science. There's not only that that stood out. You said they were both on the same path at the very beginning. I was kind of... Uh, that was interesting. So I was trying to kind of make this. He knows... He said that in other instances too in other conversations science and religion he knows this kind of axiom crowley's axiom do i always approach it more as a science than religion life and that was the only thing keeping me going it was the only thing that was allowing me to deal with a lot of the pain that i was having if i were out here and i could have went to a doctor or i could have went to a dentist i probably wouldn't have been Nearly as dedicated to it as I wasn't there. But you know, doing it, you learn so much more. It, it's almost impossible to even articulate. You know, you learn things that seem like miracles that most people out here won't ever know just because they won't have to delve that deeply into it. And I think eventually in my life, that's what I'd like to end up doing. Um, you know, after things die down a little bit, maybe. You know, we live in a small town now, maybe have like a little meditation center where I could share some of the same things I learned in person. 
prison and help me survive with other people who are in desperate situations in life. You stay faithful to the magic. Exactly. Exactly. You stay faithful to the magic. Exactly. Exactly. That seems to be wasted in this in this video. I don't know what's going on. I know that you have a lot of supporters, obviously, you know, less than the city uh, uh, of you know, around the globe, a lot of supporters, um, and a lot of set of celebrity uh, supporters, uh, uh, Henry Rollins, certainly Eddie Vedder. See, there you go. Smith. Patty Smith. Yeah. If you want to have a bad day, look into Patty Smith's background. Friends with Mapplethorpe, all kinds of a witchy occultism. That's a whole nother rabbit well, hole to we, open up. We, we could do a whole show on that. Yep. Patty Smith is something else. Yeah, but she was a supporter too. Uh, what? That's so one little category of very complex story, but there was also there were people who would come in and bring some spiritual advisors or leaders or. He spoke about the, in the book, he was great, a piece about uh, the, the, the priest with the motorcycle, the, the goatee, and the, the bald head, and, um, and the, the master of the coming. These people became like family the rest of the time. I mean, even on Johnny, Johnny had become like a brother to me over the years. You know, even since I've gotten out. It wasn't like, well, look at him right now. He's sitting here. You know, he, this is certainly not advancing his career anymore. <laughs> so Johnny's like a brother to him, and we can pull up some more pictures. Like, he's got wow. these, yeah, he's got these other tattoos that are the same, you know. So this William, is William, why do you think he jumped into uh, to Damien's cause? What, what, what attracted them together? The magic? I think so. I think that would be my opinion, yeah. Similar fellow travelers but Depp has a lot more money so I think that he could fill in can you put up that one shot I have sure there? man I appreciate it so that's called like the it's kind of it's a Great. sigil surrounded by the Theban alphabet right so the Theban alphabet is like also known as the witch language so Eccles has these and he's wow. put on all of his friends I think Depp has actually right. two of them so you kind of have an intention and you sigilize it and then that intention is supposed to stay with you. So that's kind of the magic. So they're basically putting spells on their body. I think so. Wow. That's freaking so. interesting. Yeah, we can do like, we can go into Eccles whole spell body, but they got, this guy was, he's a famous, if you can up, uh, put me on. So this guy, Mark Mahoney is kind of a famous uh, tattoo artist on sunset in LA. Mm -hmm. And so this is after they go, this is Crowley's birthday too. So I don't know if that they meant that, but, uh, October 12th is when Crowley was born. Wow. October 12th, 2011, Johnny had the I Ching hexagram of Wind Over Heaven tattooed on the back of his right arm by Mark Mahoney. Johnny has accompanied to Damon Eccles, one of the last ones the three to have an identical tattoo. You got that photo of him and Marilyn Manson. That was kind yeah, of creepy. So, wow, we have birds of a feather. Absolutely. Birds of a feather. It sure seems like that. William, I'm having trouble understanding, like, this is why I kind of hinted at this has to be, I guess, a bigger kind of thing, because why in the hell would Johnny Depp this be pulled, you know, this movie star be pulled into this random kid's story and become, as they said, brothers. And what what, what the hell's going on, man? It, it, do they is that part of the, the thing, the rite of passage in Hollywood? Does he have to do well, this? Is there well, what the can you make any sense of it to the average viewer that might be scratching their head going? I don't know. What's, 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 why? Well, wouldn't you say like the average person has their own pet religion? So if they're in like the Beatles are into, right. what do you call it? Into Eastern philosophy, they have their own guy. And then somebody has their own Christian thing they support. I think that that's their relationship between Eccles and Depp. And you, do you know any, uh, do you know how, how deep Johnny Depp's involvement in the occult might actually go? I've heard a lot. Like you can go through his films, and those are good in, insight into I the think his personality. Gate. Yeah. yeah, Ninth Gate. Uh, what's the other one? I mean, you can just go through. I have like a list of them here. Ninth Gate, Gr uh, Grindelwald. He plays the bad guy. 
He's playing kind of like a character of Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, Dark Shadows. Right. right. Um, astronaut's Grindelwald. wife. Does the astronaut's wife or whatever planted that? Right. Any- from Hell. Remember From Hell. Right. Yeah, Imaginarium yeah. of Doctor Doctor Parnassus. Another which, guy who which died Heath young. Ledger uh, was. Right. Th- yeah. There's so, a ton of symbolism in that freaking movie. Yeah. <laughs> from Hell. I mean, they're all occult. Uh, what's the other one where the the guy he plays the um, barber who barber who kills people in England? Oh. Um, <sighs> God, I, I know you're. T- I know what you're talking about. He played in a movie. Um, yeah, yeah. Hey, William, what about what about this? Let me show you this. You know, he was talking about in that interview, and he said over and over how I, I don't know which to make. He's either in solitary confinement or he's getting you know shanked. Yeah, right, uh, right. yeah. and you mentioned you mentioned he's actually using some of his occult symbolism in some of these. Uh, these videos so yeah pull up can you pull up what i have right there i'll show you some of yeah sure stuff so this is just some of the pictures I, he's making these hand gestures like lady gaga i mean you can go through all this stuff it's off the charts lady gaga this is him after he got released dressed up as a vampire or something this is him with all these famous people there he is with peter jackson right right um anderson cooper i forgot it's just anderson unbelievable cooper. man who him and depp this is this Paris. is a guy. There he is with Marilyn Manson. That's his artwork. That doesn't look uh, scary or deranged, I guess. Right, right. He's making hand signs. Hey, I mean, just there's just tons of stuff. Is it just one big Freemasonic club, and we're not in it, William? Or I was in it, but I got out because I was. Cool. Ha- yeah. I, I, I was going to have a, a decent career in Hollywood before I woke up out of this shit, man. But unfortunately, I can't go back knowing what I know now try to explain that to my friends too by the way that are like <clears throat> hey man just go back to hollywood man you got your mind back from scientology everything's good it's like it's freaking impossible now william you know i guess right. this is kind of what keeps people from wanting to look what's right in front of their face this denial man because dude part of me does does wish i i was just back in scientology i'd have my family and i would have had a career and i'd be none the wiser that's another thing william i wonder how many of these people actually consciously really know what they're involved in or if they're a part of one of these cults and they just think it's something good and they don't see the bigger picture they don't know what they're a part of they don't know why they get better roles they don't know any of that stuff i didn't know any of that freaking stuff man and there i there i was a part of one of these very secret societies a lot of these people seem to be a part of whether it's the oto you know scientology i heard that like all that magic's all over hollywood what would make you, you say that? that? No. <laughs> I've just heard that. I've just heard that. No, I, well, I mean, the very word Hollywood, I mean, yeah. comes from magic. Yeah. Okay. So there's Depp and Eccles hanging out. You can see Eccles has all these tattoos now. There's another one with like Berlinger. Like they're all chummy. Like if you think Berlinger is some objective, objective documentarian, you know, he's always hanging out with these guys. Pull that one up. There's Eccles, Berlinger. Dab. William, what do you think the impetus was for? Do you know who the characters are behind the first HBO movie and why they might want to have gone down the route that they did and even picked this thing up to begin with? Who are oh, these that's people? A great question. That's a super good question. I don't know. Berlinger, I've heard, has an interesting career. He's done some stuff. I think he did stuff for um, my, I've been told by other people, he did that movie about, Al, about Bundy that kind of glorified Bundy. He was a serial killer, and uh, Netflix wasn't really happy with it. Um, so, you know, he's done some curious projects. But I do think that whoever greenlit that whole series, that trilogy about the West Memphis Three, was really irresponsible. And I think that's the main cause why he got out. And right. I was just going to ask you that. I mean, that is the cause that he got out, right? I mean, minus those, that wouldn't happen. Do you think on and, a deeper level? And an interesting some- thing to add to that, Doug, is that it seems like I've talked to Roberta Glass about that. It seems like this innocence fraudsters have learned to make their own documentaries now that cover their, you know, that try to win in the public opinion, uh, public domain, so that you see all these other like documentaries that are totally full of baloney. Can't remember Will the you- one get. William, you passed the bar. You practice law, right? What What would you, what do you make of the justice system that seems to be uh, going 
you know, towards just letting people off a uh, court of public opinion. I mean, is it's this terrible? Because William, they'd yeah. still, these people, yeah. these people, there was enough evidence to convict them. Two juries, right? The jury right. of science, I think you said, as well as the original jurors. Right. Um, they, people say, oh, there's no DNA evidence, this and that. You know, circumstantial evidence, the amount of evidence that was presented, let alone what wasn't presented, is pretty overwhelming if people look into it. So why why wouldn't they just stay in jail? It seems like they got out by a freaking PR machine. That's dangerous. I think, so. I think they, like I think they kept pressure. Yeah. Put pressure on the state of Arkansas. They had a change in judges. They were winning in the public domain, court of public opinion. And the new prosecutor and blink. And that's what supposedly is the front story. I don't know. You know, I'm not it's when sketchy things like that happen, you know, it makes you wonder. But there was a change of the guard, and that's kind of what I think what happened. And the public opinion, people, even lawyers can get cowed by the public opinion. They're always right, thinking right. about that, you know. So I think that, right. you know, they played their cards right, and the, the opportunity arose. And, I mean, you want to talk about, like, no DNA. It's called the CSI effect. You have to have DNA to convict. Before the advent of DNA, tons of people were going to jail. You know, the whole court system right, worked right. up until 1980 from the beginning of time without DNA evidence. So people who think that there had to have DNA is ridiculous. And there were things that weren't brought into court. There was a massive of luminol showed blood on the scene of the crime. That didn't get. Yeah, I in. caught that. That That's another myth that people don't realize. Yeah. They say, hey, there was no freaking blood there. That's that's actually false. Right. There was a whole thing, like you yeah, said, that lit up. lit up. Yeah. So there was enough evidence. I mean, that's the whole thing is why you have a, the system the way it is. You have jurors look at everything that comes across. Right. They had compelling testimony of people who saw him at the scene, near the scene of the crime, muddy. You had to be muddy to be in that water. And you had the testimony of young kids who heard him talking at a baseball game. Um, his, and he got up on the stand. He got he knew information. I mean, I think that on examination, the prosecutor showed that he had information that wasn't in the newspaper. So how do you have that? You have to be at the crime and the jury's listening to that. And I don't think that I'm against having video in trials because it takes away from the solemnity and the kind of gravity of the situation because people Definitely. Will make jokes about it. They'll key into somebody's shirt instead of looking at everything that's being brought in about a serious consequence and in a very serious situation. Like I think that the judge in the OJ trial made a huge mistake. Usually it's the judge's discretion. Um, is it? They never or should have put the video get... in there, yeah. or or Depper. They shouldn't have the video. It made it into a circus. When there's something that big, William, isn't there a lot of money and people behind it that want it's to get just... that televised? Everything. I would. Yeah, I think so. I think that they want to win the court of public opinion, especially exactly. if they're guilty, right? Or they're involved. If they're exactly. involved in something, they don't want the court to make the decision. So they make the appeal. There's so many guys. And there isn't a prohibition in the law. It's very interesting. You can make statements in court and statements outside of court that contradict what you said in court. It's a very strange thing about the lawyers. So they, a lot of these people, very famous names that you know, say things that outside of the court that are deceptive. And I would call that kind of uh, unethical. Definitely. So I and I Definitely. think that, that I'm surprised that's actually allowed. I'm surprised in the era of PR and that I'm surprised that the, the law uh, field hasn't caught up with it because these guys just blow. I mean, some of the blarney that these uh, attorneys get away with, they're de definitely contradict with the arguments they've made. Right. And the right. serious thing where you can get disbarred, where you can get persecuted. I mean, prosecuted and persecuted, really. But like if you do stuff in court that's unethical or you're cheating, you can get disbarred and put in jail. So it's weird to have people go outside of court and talk, do that stuff. So, um, yeah, but yeah, it's uh, this case hey, is really something else. It's really it seemed, American saga. It really is, and you know, it's just the same repeating cycle because it's a it's a Manson thing that never goes away. And like I said, it seems to sell a lot of movies and provide a lot of uh, speculation. It doesn't seem about solving the, William. I think it just covers up bigger activity. I don't think it's about solving the case. It's usually just no, some no. monster and story that gets created permanently injected into the mind of the subconscious of human beings that becomes the official story and it has nothing to do with actually getting to the bottom of any of these things because because check this out you i don't know anything about this case you're the expert you wrote a very thick book on it with case files but i'm just talking about when i just look at this guy or listen to him 
he's lying constantly and the contradictions and why anybody, maybe they just go, okay, this guy may or may not be guilty, but I certainly don't want to support him. This guy has a cult following, man. I mean, he made a whole bunch of money with the cult books and almost, you know, started up his own cult. Um, when he, he got might out of have this, one, he might have a cult. You don't really know. I mean, I know he started up his own kind of thing when he moved to Massachusetts to Salem. So yeah, he's making the sign of silence right there. So he's got all the hand gestures down. Let's check just this a, out, like man. Just, just as an example of yeah, a three-year-old could kind of tell he's lying. And then, like you said, we got the, the sign of silence going on and his, his, his girlfriend or wife at the time is you acting a little daylight. funky. Never. I hadn't seen daylight in almost a decade. I hadn't been exposed to sunlight. In 10 years? For almost 10 years, yes. What are you thinking throughout this period? I mean, this is, for an innocent man, as many believe that you are, and you've always protested this, what are you thinking when you're stuck in there? The only thing, the only thing you can do and maintain your sanity is to not think about the case and not think about what's happening to you. You have to sort of immerse yourself into a routine and never deviate from that routine. You know, work out your own exercise regimen, work out a meditation regimen, um, start some sort of practice, whether it be artwork, writing, whatever it is. You have to um, create your own world in there or you'll go insane from that stuff. I don't know how you keep your sanity. You don't have a choice. You know, it's not like you can get up one day and say, you know, I quit. I'm tired of this. I'm going home. Uh, you just do whatever it takes to keep putting one foot in front of the other and get to the next day. What effect did it have on your health? My health, there's almost no medical care, no dental care, things like that in prison. So my health was deteriorating very rapidly. I, I've lost a great deal of my eyesight. Um, whenever you're in a confined space, you never get a chance to see anything far away. So you gradually lose the ability to. So I started losing my ability to see anything further than a few inches away from me. And I was extremely light sensitive due to the fact of not having seen sunlight. Yeah, but that first years. moment you came out, what was it like to have daylight again? It was like having a spotlight turned right in your face. William, is he knowingly doing these uh, occult signs? Somebody would yeah, say, hey, that's just a guy putting over his mouth. But I think this is someone who, yeah, I do too. That's very, very interesting. Those are, uh, you can go through Hollywood. These guys all know the same signs. Hand over eye, sign of silence, all that kind of weird stuff. They know. So what do you think? Uh, how long would we go? Okay, we're going about an hour. So I guess we can start to kind of conclude, William. Like, you okay. know, I, I'm a relative newbie, you know, in the field of going down rabbit holes. But with the, all the books you've written and and all the information that you put together in the cases that you look, what is basically your summation of not just the Eccles case, but just kind of how, how things work in general? What, what, what have you, how do you, how do you see the world now? Well, a lot differently. I think a cult has an influence on cases and political events, cult ideas, secret ideas. And uh, I think my books prove that, that they influence people, people influence events. And uh, some people are motivated by, motivated by them to commit crimes. So I think that that was really kind of why I put a lot of my books together is go, hey, there's a lot more going on here than the corporate media wants to tell you or the FBI who, you know, says there's no cult motiv motivation in crimes, according to the landing report. So uh, I think that that would be kind of the summation of all my books, especially like my most recent book, Global Death Cult. You can tell these ideas are influencing people to make to engage in criminal uh, criminal activity. Or influencing them. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, oh man, I thank God I didn't get too caught up in that, man. I was never going to murder anybody, but I didn't know I was involved uh, in a version of the occult. That's what L. Ron Hubbard was, man. That's the big super yeah. secret that you learn is basically he, his inversion yeah. of Book of Revelations, where he he admits that he's coming to halt the second coming. He's Lucifer, the light bringer. William, like Hubbard was into the same book that was in the Eccles thing, you know, he told us as Scientologists in the Philadelphia doctorate course to pick up, you know, ma uh, the master theory magic. on it, magic and theory. Yeah. And magic practice. And theory yeah. Practice, right? yeah. And he, he was an Eccles himself. He was practicing black magic. I believe he started age 15 and look at what he turned into. So I guess you can have somebody that I guess gets into the occult because my dad was into it and just thinks I'm bait doing tools for life. And then you have other people like, um, you know, well, I mean, you have people like L. Ron Hubbard who take this shit seriously, man. 
and he, Satanism he is their life. And look at what he created, yeah, William. He look created at what he something different. To he, took in, he took in all that behavioral studies, yeah. all that mind control, mm -hmm. and integrated into kind of a cult structure. Like he really did something that the world I don't think had seen before. They'd seen the secret society right. model and the great society. Right, right. But his stuff, I was looking over the Giddinger personality test. And I was like, this is just like Scientology. They're they're weeding and seeding through people through these personality tests. You would never exactly. really win it. Yeah. But they're getting a good idea. And that's all that yeah. behavioral studies, MK Ultra that came out of the 50s. Yeah. It's not a coincidence that Scientology well, yeah. started in 1950. Like that's it's such there. a shame, brother. I had to find this out the hard way, like I said, growing up. But how do we uh tap our buddies on the on on the on the shoulder and let them know kind of you know? <laughs> Not everybody's there to help you. Yeah, these cults are there to control you. And Scientology does probably one of the best controlling cults out there. It Better really is. Those. You know, it's yeah. kind of on the downfall, William, because since the COVID hit, they've been, and plus David Miscavige, the leader's imploding it. And who knows what agency will take over next. And some people speculate Tom Cruise, whatever. But they only have, uh, they're dwindling and they got really hit since the COVID thing. But you know what? When Scientology goes away, there'll be an, a better, even newer model of how to perfect this freaking thing. And and my my whole thing is, why do we have any of this stuff? Why are we born into a world where this shit is, is allowed to exist? I, I guess I'm really naive, William. I'm just, I just don't understand it because I don't know why I had another kids have to go through this. I, it's, it's a it's huge it's, part it's of a, the global. It's a criminal theory. enterprise. Yeah. yeah. Oh, totally. I think the Germans got it right by banning Scientology. I think they understood right, right. The, yeah. well, how sophisticated it was and, and how they subversive. Did. Yeah. yeah, they were. The Americans didn't. They don't understand how how potent it was in in really mind control. It's all there's all kinds of weird. Uh, the behavioral sciences are all there. Like he picked it up, or somebody. I don't even know if Hubbard wrote all his books. You know, it's like it might have uh, been a group uh, effort, just like the ONA. What are your speculation on on Hubbard's whole creation? Mm -hmm. I mean, what how, how do you uh, think that whole freaking? It thing gets went? so deep. He might might and might have had some type of intel connection that was helping him put it together and, and teaching him and puppeteering a, him yeah he was a you know he's always on drugs he was a drunk i mean he did everything you know in demand when the hell did he write um you yeah, know when did get, he write it yeah well he would dope he would get up on speed and he mm -hmm. would you know bust a typewriter i believe that those are actually true mm -hmm. and he dictated a lot of stuff and also he stole a lot of ideas when he sent his students out to do auditing and stuff he would just take back their ideas that's mm -hmm. where he got the study text somebody else came up with it and he took credit for it, declares them an SP and gets rid of them. So he didn't, you know, I don't think he he didn't come up with all that. And perhaps he didn't even write it. There's speculation that it's a part of an intelligence agency. Hubbard, you know, it's basically MK Ultra on steroids. Where did he get all that? William, we learned all sorts of. Um, That's where it gets scary because I can research. I'm researching that MK Ultra stuff and you can see the little places where this new post-World War II ideas on on human behaviorism and how to control that human ecology type stuff is in that's there, when dude. it really kicked it's off in scientology man. yeah it's not just but hey, black magic but hey william thank god you know we're told by the intelligence agencies that mk ultra is unsuccessful they weren't right. able to make manchurian candidates and it went away in the 70s so what we're seeing today has no relevance and they destroyed god. all the records thank god they got rid of it right yeah it's funny that we would trust the very people who did those things to tell us the outcome of that it just gets really hairy doesn't it my friend it does and they i think they took a lot of the stuff from the nazi experiments i think that were actually started before 1953 so they brought in a right. lot of that torture right, right. that the Nazis were doing, and uh, they got it through, got it through the rat lines and all this paperclip stuff, and it got integrated into continuing studies. So it's really scary. Like they did horrible stuff in, in uh, Europe. So Absolutely. it's really you're kind of like in the, in a science fiction movie. It's much, and they don't teach you that. I think that's why like, the whole py pyramidal structure is like. Because the public school is part of it. They don't teach you all those things you have to learn is to avoid these traps like Scientology. You have to learn it outside, which I think is a shame. That's kind Forms of what of I, control. Yeah. 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 That's kind of what I want to ask you. Do you think a solution would be to somehow, even though everything's suppressed, to educate people when yeah. they're growing up in the high schools about about the stuff that we learn, William, the hard way? Yeah. What do you think? I learned the it way the hard way. I learned it the hard way, yeah. First of all, do you think if people, if more of the population were taught this and they they knew how their minds work better and they knew about coercive control, do you think that that waking up alone would change the world and the corruption at the top of the pyramid? Do you think Absolutely. that would actually fix it? 
You think that? I don't know if it would fix it, but it would inoculate people from these types of events. They wouldn't, they'd mm -hmm. understand somebody's trying to traumatize them. Mm -hmm. Somebody's trying to control their output, right. what they're seeing. They're trying to reformat their brain or depattern yeah. and repattern. Yeah. Like they're, the repatterning and depatterning process doesn't have to be in an environment where you're isolated and there's no. Sound. I can attest to that. It happened. It happened to me in the open air. I was a free to yeah. come and go public Scientologist and it did everything that you just yeah. described. So, so I, you're, I, but it's not just Scientology. It's anything else. Oh no. I'm just, it's a microcosm these, of the yeah. macrocosm is what I yeah. call Scientology. It's just another one that's come along for something that's been going on a long time, William. And like I said, I might be naive, but I'm really motivated to, you know, before I roll out of here, I would like to uh, leave some mark like you're doing to try to leave a better generation because if we don't william we're going to be leaving a world behind that's going to make scientology look like um child's play that's the kind of preview i got so um first there's very simple you had technology uh hubbard did yeah, not have high I know. technology that was in the 50s where yeah, he did have the technology it's yeah. like william a yeah, is, like, no, yeah, hair on what watching what's today, going dude. on man this ai there's have you heard of Deep Dream, a project Deep Dream? No, I haven't. Oh, you don't even want to know about it. I don't. Just from the it's terrible. That, that sounds it's a like an MK Ultra project. Uh, it, 20, uh, but just imagine like AI, internet, mind control. The metaverse. It's like, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> like you they're look uh, they they knew before 53 there was a hypnosis spectrum. They were very aware of that in the 40s. So and they what knew is that, that everybody was on. Yeah, I can pull what? that up. I, forgot the doctor that's all right if but they can, knew so they know it today somebody's on that spectrum so they can like if you're one of those easily hypnotized persons right you know, really watch out i vaguely remember what you're talking about it's like 80 to 90 percent. i have this one of my videos it was 80 90 percent of the population can be hypnotized and then there was five to ten percent that was super suggestible super um, suggestible, but, but basically right. everybody can be I mean, well, let me ask right. you this, William. I would say it's a hundred percent because when we when I don't we think break... you can. I, I've never been hypnotized. I was not. I was one of well, those people who's not on it. It's let me, called the Stanford Hypnotic let me, Susceptibility Scale. Let me let me explain in more detail what I mean. Sure, for I I believe in that scale, but William, what I was saying is, when we pop out of the womb, we're immediately bombarded with all the propaganda, like you said, the schooling system. So hypnotizable or not, do you think we're always, everybody's programmable, I guess is the right word? Yeah, I think that you're viewed as a human resource. I think so. I yeah, think yeah. in America, it gets very sinister. Um, that people on the top, not, uh, yeah, you're not, yeah, I think there's a very much of an intellectual class system and the people at the top, the ruling class here knows a lot more information than the people underneath the, uh, the top they, they've accrued so much information yeah World War II yeah about social control yeah and manipulation trauma-based mind control and uh, that the public has no idea about it. it takes it takes a while even with the internet it takes a while to really digest that but there's probably these ruling class people these elites there's probably one thing this is your whole next step in learning son you learn this at 21 this is how you there's a technique and a technology for a total social control in the united states i truly believe that. yeah i don't really believe that i know it to be true through personal experience so what motivates you to kind of wake up in the morning and deal with this stuff do you feel that there's hope and do you feel like you can we you know we can actually spread this I, information I that's kept that that's kept from us you can say this is a podcast or this is like a discussion but you're educating i'm educating myself and people about this so that they're much more aware like I look at back at some of these human events, like you see Operation Chaos or you see 9-11, you see those components of social control and manipulation mm -hmm. in those events. So I'm much more, uh, I see the sophistication in the thinking of some of these people. Like literally, it's like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> like they're behind a you know, curtain. Exactly. No question. You, that actually you, ties into Crowley, like Oz is for him. Is yeah, yeah. Do you feel like sometimes, I mean, especially when this pandemic hit, William, I felt like, and I'm still coming out of it, I feel like I'm just living in a dream world. It all yeah. feels so unreal and so out, so crazy. But hey, would you rather know what you know now and have, you know learn what you learn uh, so that you can deal with the situations today? Or would you rather uh, not know what you know and just- Right, it's a, like the matrix question, right? Yeah. I would definitely like to know. What would you, what, yeah. It's not an easy I would have process. to say the same thing too. Don't you think, yeah. I think the more people that know William, the easier it will get and the less isolation there'll be for the conspiracy theorists, which I, I, by the way, I'd like to point out that that's a thought terminating cliche in mind control parlance. 
Um, anybody that questions, it's designed to shut down the debate. There's a million words like that. Uh, but that that word always drove me nuts. Conspiracy theorists as if there could never be a debate about it. Is there an actual conspiracy going on? And as you know, the you know, the CIA, I believed, um, popularized that term to question people that were questioning the magic bullet ridiculous right. theory of, um, you know, how yeah, Kennedy yeah. was shot. Yeah. Hey, William, I really appreciate you just on a personal level for all the years that you've spent educating me and everybody else. That's the best we can do. And you've put a lot of work in it. You speak Thanks. to people, incredible guests. Uh, every day, almost every day yourself. Could you, um, so thank you for coming on. And thanks, then in I closing, thanks for me. I, yeah, thanks, ma'am. Could you please tell people anything you'd like to say, where they can find you, um, where they could get your products and whatever else you'd like to say. Yeah, you can see on my uh, podcast, broadcast has about 700 episodes right now. So I'm, we've done a lot. I've talked about a lot of different subjects, SFK mind control, um, cults, true crime. So maybe there's something for somebody who wants to hear that. All you have to do is go to iTunes and type in William Ramsey Investigates. I've got five books you can find on my websites. Website, WilliamRamseyInvestigates.com. And then five documentaries. If you'd rather a more visual viewer, listener, learner, you can go to Vimeo and type in William Ramsey Investigates. You can see my videos. I've done two on the smiley face killer phenomenon, two on Crowley, and one on a cold holiday. Do you have any specific video or top three that I can put in a link in the description box on the West Memphis case in particular? Because you've done so many of them. If anybody wanted more information, anything you could send me or, or, any, yeah, or, I mean, or do I they just that... have to dive into it? Because it's a whole huge case that we barely touched on. Is there any summation uh, videos I could send people to? I mean, I think I did a recent one where I went through and we looked through at all the pictures uh, in turn. So I'll send you the link to that. That's the most Thanks, recent man. one. And I think that has a lot of the pictures of Depp and Eccles. And you see how, like, what's going on is so much different than what they're telling the public. Yeah. We didn't even get to scratch the surface. And audience, William has done um, many, many interviews. He just did one with Roberta Glass recently. He's talked to people that are far more knowledgeable in this case. So if they, you have any interest in these subjects, um, please check out William's YouTube channel. And William Ramsey investigates if you'd like to purchase any of the books. William, my friend, thank you very much for coming on, man. I really Doug, appreciate thanks, it. Appreciate it. Thanks for thank having you, me. Thank you, brother. Thanks, Great to man. be with you. God Bye. bless. Right,